Amen. Well, it's good to be here today. Good to see you folks. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate God's uh, <clears throat> presence here this morning. I feel a sense and attitude and his spirit, not just a spirit, but his spirit of worship. I don't want to come to church if uh, his spirit's not here. Amen. I'm glad he is. Now, as far as tonight, let me remind you how this works. Um, this is never mandatory, and so if you're shy and bashful, I don't want you to stay away. But uh, tonight will be a testimony service, and you, everyone is welcome to, to give a testimony of Thanksgiving tonight. So I want you to be thinking about that. And again, if you are just, if that thought just terrifies you, then don't worry about it. Come and be thankful and listen to others. So that's not, that's not what this is about. But um, remember, we always try to gauge this spiritually. I know that I'm thankful for the roof over my head, for the clothes I have and the shoes on my feet and all that. But our gratitude needs to go deeper than that, doesn't it? We need to be thankful for God's great salvation, what he's done for us, how he has come to us, and how we are nothing without him. And I trust that that uh, presses on your soul daily and I hope that you and I both never lose that sense of gratitude for that so I want to hear that expressed tonight I love this service every year and so when you folks are done giving thanks we will go across the way and have a meal together we haven't done that very much um, but we're gonna get to do it tonight and so since you know Chris just had us all shake hands we'll probably have a huge COVID outbreak and I'll see you in a couple of weeks but <laughs> You never know. That's not really funny, is it? Uh, but nonetheless, um, I trust that you'll be here tonight, and I know that you will be blessed if you come. So that's what's happening this evening, so I look forward to seeing you. Let's find First Peter chapter 1, please. I have to admit that this passage today has somewhat consumed me. It has somewhat obsessed my mental faculty. It has it just overwhelmed me in every sense. And in this way, I am grateful. I am grateful that God has seen to it and done whatever has been necessary to make sure that I have heard the truth. Amen. Didn't have to do that. I could be somewhere in a dark corner of the world hoping and praying that a missionary would come and tell me the truth about Jesus Christ. One of the great indictments of our generation upon American Christians, and this I place myself firmly in the middle of this indictment, is that we have had more truth available to us than any other generation of Christians ever, ever. This entire nation has had the truth of the gospel presented to it over and over and over again. To stand before God one day, having rejected the truth, and having been born in the United States of America, will be a terrible and dreadful thing. Everyone here has heard the truth. Not everyone has responded and believed. What a great judgment that will be. Well, if you have analyzed this passage as I have, and I know you've thought about it, hopefully, as I have presented it to you, what Peter's doing here is he's encouraging these suffering believers using one simple theme. If God has thought enough of you to save you, then God will do whatever it takes to keep you in the midst of difficulty. One thing that I've never understood is how people believe that one can be saved and then lose their salvation. Why in the world would God go to the lengths of sending his son to die and pay the penalty for our sins? And then leave it up to us as to whether or not we keep our salvation or not. Why would God waste his effort on someone like me who is incapable of keeping himself saved? Why would God do what he has done without also putting in place a process and the plan whereby he keeps me in his arms safe and secure? And so that's what Simon Peter is saying to these believers. He's simply reminding them of the salvation to which they have been called. A salvation that, to his point, makes the allure and the enticement of the world seem as trinkets and as 
nothing. Really, this life is a matter of two questions. We all go through difficulties. We will always ask one of two questions. First, and usually the most common, is, Lord, why is this happening to me? People ask that all the time. They ask it of me, and I don't know the answers, and, and I have asked it myself, and I've never, I've never had that question answered. I've never seen an answer for anybody else. Why is this happening to me? I don't think God's interested in answering that question. I don't think that matters to him. The second question is different. You ask this question, at some point, maybe not immediately, but at some point you will have the answer. I think God delights in giving his children the answer to this second question. Lord, what are you doing? And how does it involve me? See, the first one is self-centered. The first one is, Lord, I don't deserve this. <laughs> Why is this? Why am I going through this? The second one is God-centered. Lord, I don't deserve to be a part of your family. I don't deserve the honor of suffering for you. But I know that you have a sovereign will and plan. And that you delight in using me in that plan, in various and sundry ways. If it would please you, would you help me to understand what you're doing so I can honor you to the best of my ability? A second question is fruitful. That second question is, is productive. That second question is, is all of a sudden not, it becomes not about me, but it, it, it becomes about him. And I think God always delights in his time and his way to answer that second. I think that's what Simon Peter is getting at as he's trying to encourage these suffering, struggling believers. He, he's, he's writing to these believers scattered across Asia Minor. He's trying to reshape in their minds the truth that God's ultimate purpose in the universe not just in them, but in the universe, is calling out a people unto himself. He's going to talk about that later. That's what God's doing. If you want to know what God's plan is, if you want a definition of it, it is to call out a people unto himself. Everything else is subject to that plan. God's concern is about those who are going to be saved. God's concern is about those who have already been saved. He orchestrates and plans everything else in the universe, everything in, in the world to apply either to bring out Christ's likeness in them, to help them to grow, or to honor himself through them in some way. That's what God is doing. And if these people like us could get a glimpse of that, really there's no difficulty we can face that should overwhelm us or discourage us to the point of unbelief. Now, the answer to the question of God, what are you doing? Simon Peter continues to answer that. And the answer has several avenues that can be taken. Someone has outlined this introduction in this way. And I think I've got it on the next slide. I just wanted you to see this to be reminded. The first part of this passage, we talked about salvation's future reward. Simon Peter basically says, you know what? It may be bad now, but it's worth it in the end. Always is. The second thing he does in verses 6 through 9 is he says, you will go through adversity. Your salvation will be won. And, and make no mistake, there is an aspect, a, a sense in which our salvation must be won. Now, we don't work for it. But I'm talking about our future glory, our, our glory in heaven with him must be won through trials on earth. That is biblical. I'm not saved by my faithfulness, but my reward will be determined by my faithfulness. Salvation's present adversity is a real thing, but there's a reason for it. And now here in these verses, 10 through 12, Simon Peter presents to them salvation's past glory. That's what we're talking about today. It is the, in the, 
it is the beautiful close of his introduction that we've come to. Where Simon Peter wraps it all up and says, look, I know what you're going through. But you need to understand, looking at the past helps you to reshape and reform in your mind what God has been doing all along. What he's always done through his people and what he will do through you if you let him. And so what he tells them is you're his people. You belong to him. You're his church. You're his body. You're his bride. You are the called out congregation. If you are that, then here is what God has done. He does that by presenting three different voices from the past. First of all, he presents to them the voice of the prophet. Look in verse number 10. Of which salvation, Peter writes, the prophets have inquired and have searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow the prophets. We don't talk much about them anymore. We turn to the Old Testament and we, we, we know there are major prophets. They got big thick books and man, how many of y'all have read through a major prophet lately? You just can't wait to do it, can you? Even more meticulous is to read the minor prophets. Because most of the time we have no idea what the context is, what they're writing about. And, and, and so we read that and we're like, what does that mean to me? Well, you need to understand that to be an Old Testament prophet, number one was a great honor. To be a member of this band of men of old who spent days and nights searching out the mysteries of God's salvation. Peter writes first of all of the subject that intrigued them. What were they searching? Well first of all I think they were trying to search out and figure out the person of Christ or the person of the Messiah. You look at that verse and he says they searched and inquired diligently who prophesied the grace that should come to you searching what, what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which is, was in them did signify. When is this going to happen? God is going to save his people. We get bits and pieces of information. We see these little slides as they appear on the screen in our visions before us. But we don't understand what it's about. And so they searched. They inquired. They asked. The mystery. Who is this person? What would he be like? How can a holy God accomplished the salvation of sinful men. How is he going to forgive people who had transgressed every law and every principle emanating from God's holiness? How can God turn the other way? How can he forgive anybody? That was the question. How was he going to do it? Was it through the blood of, 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 of goats and bulls? Was it through blood sacrifices of animals? Was it through rituals? Was it because of obedience? What? How would he do it? They searched. They were intrigued. They wanted to understand the mystery. How would he send it? And who would he send to bring it to pass? For Moses to Malachi, they searched and they looked and they were enthralled, intrigued, and puzzled and motivi motivated, but none of them ever saw perfectly. What God would do. We look at the Old Testament characters and we think, man, they, they were just saved because they loved God and obeyed him. No, they weren't. They were saved because they believed God and followed him the same way you are. You are saved and I'm saved because we trust him. And then after that, we prove that trust by following him. That's exactly what they but they were trusting in something that was in the future, while we are trusting in something that was in the past. Who would this person be? Isaiah wrote of one who would bear our sins and our sorrows, but he never knew who he was. Abraham, if you consider him a prophet, as, as do I, Believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But who did he believe in? He didn't know who Jesus was. Moses, the first real great prophet of Israel. 
had, had and lived various episodes in his life that literally spoke of Jesus, the one that would come, but he never knew exactly who he was. Every single prophet gets a glimpse, but they never come to full knowledge until you see the last Old Testament prophet. And it's not Malachi. I know you think that he's the last one. No, he's not. There's one who appears in the Gospels who, in my firm belief, is the last Old Testament prophet, and his name is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was given information. John the Baptist was given vision. John the Baptist didn't, under, didn't understand everything, but only John the Baptist was blessed to be able to look up as he stood in baptismal waters in a river and see on a bank the one coming down the hill. And his words, no other prophet had ever been able to say this. In his words, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But you know, even old John didn't get it all straight. He was in prison. He begins to think, Now, <laughs> is this really him? Or was I mistaken? He sends word and asks him. None of the prophets ever had the assurance that we do. They long to understand the person of Christ. But they also long to understand the purpose of Christ. I say off our sin, our iniquity, bear those things. He portrayed him as a suffering servant. But by the time Jesus was born, Jewish theology had changed the point. No first century Jew would have accepted the idea of a suffering Messiah. Didn't. Now, if you look at the Gospels, everything they wanted Jesus to be was about victory. It was about conquering. It was about winning. It was about coming out on top. It was about driving those Romans away. No first century Jew would have accepted a suffering Jesus. They wanted the Christ of glory. And yet, that's exactly the kind of gospel that Peter says you must believe. You must believe the gospel of the suffering Christ. Who in turn will ask you to suffer. No, nobody's ever said that to you before. <laughs> See, we're here in America, we got this idea that when I come to Jesus, he's going to fix all my life, make, it, make everything smooth. <laughs> I've said this for 30 years in this place. Sometimes coming to Christ is the one catalyst that will blow everything in your life up and ruin everything around you that you've been trusting in, that you've been leaning on. But it's that Christ, the suffering Christ, in whom you must believe and you have to follow sometimes. In suffering. I have been reading recently, and Michael Hakins, a friend of mine, great Baptist historian, man alive, he's written more books than I have read, it seems. And he wrote recently and has put a, a thought in my head that we here in America are reluctant to live the Christian life in the margins. What does he mean by that? Well, we think. But as Christians, we deserve to be front and, and center of all things in a culture or society. We think that every crowd in every football game ought to stand and honor God. We think that every concert ought to include some kind of an honoring of God. We think that public schools are going to willingly put prayer. Well, wouldn't that be nice? You probably grew up with that. Am I against prayer in schools? Oh, no. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that's our right as Christians. Nowhere. We have the idea that we as Christians are to be the motivating force of a culture or a society. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. We are not called to be the popular segment of a worldly culture or society as followers of God. Actually, the opposite is true. We are called 
And every generation of Christians throughout history has been called to be the scum of the earth, as Paul would put it. The rejected ones, the ones who live in the margins of their world. They're over here. The world is going happily on its way to hell. And we are out here in the margins. That's where Christians have always been. Get used to it. Because that's where we are now. And it hurts us. Because we're like, well, they don't, nobody, nobody stands when they pray at the ball game. Why would they stand when they don't know God? My goodness, how we are conditioned of this idea. And we are so different from every other generation of Christians who's had to suffer and were weak. So much so that we're willing to kowtow and compromise every conviction that we have. For some kind of a political victory. God help us. These first century Christians. Peter looked at them and said. You can't expect any more than to suffer. Because that's what Jesus did. We've got to learn how to live life. In the margins again. But secondly he talks about the service. In which they were enlisted. In verse number 12. He says unto whom it was revealed. That not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. What's he saying? Those prophets searching, intriguing, ministering, hearing, standing before God, hearing his word, then standing before people and telling them what God has said. They weren't serving themselves. They weren't serving their own generation. They were serving you. A generation yet to come. You see that right there it is. They, he says, was not, were not ministering to their own people as much as they were ministering to us. Hundreds of years later. You know, there's so many things to unpack there, but what an encouragement that must have been to the apostles' readers. Hey, you think God's forgotten you? No, he hasn't. He had you in his mind long before you were ever born and had this group of people ministering the truth to you, searching, intrigued, writing, motivated, puzzled, but ever looking into what God was doing. And ultimately, they did it for you. If God thought that much of you then, what must he think of you now? Why then are we discouraged? Secondly, while that may be a great encouragement, what a great indictment that is to us. Who have never known the kind of suffering that Simon Peter is talking about here. And who wither at the least sign of pressure from the world. With an opportunity to serve a generation yet to come. I wonder what many of us are going to leave behind. We're, we're about serving ourselves aren't we? What are we leaving for our children? What, what are we doing to serve the generation that's yet to come? These men never saw the fruition of their efforts. They didn't understand they were serving people in the future. But then number three, notice the spirit by which they were empowered. Simon Peter makes it a point to say in verse number um, verse number 11 that as they were searching or what matter of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Who was doing the searching in them and through them? It was none other than the Holy Spirit. Like the wind that carries an ember from a fire. The spirit of Christ carried these men from suffering to suffering. Now, later on, Simon's going to write about how the word of God was given. It was given as holy men. He, these are his words, a paraphrase were born along by the Spirit of God. And that's how they received the vision, the, the revelation, the knowledge from God they were to give to other people. They didn't understand it, but they wrote it down. You know, the same way, that's exactly how we are kept and motivated. That's exactly how we make progress, isn't it? We are born along by the Spirit of God. Without him, you and I cannot stand any temptation. We cannot withstand any trial. It is only by his grace and by his power. 
That's the first voice. There's a second voice. Look in verse number 12, as he says, let's look back not only to the voice of the prophets, let's look to the voice of the preachers. Unto whom, he says, it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. Remember, he's encouraging these believers. The one thing he's saying to them is, look, God has never left you without the truth. How many of y'all can look back in your life and you know there are men that God has used to minister to you all of your life? You know that God has allowed men the opportunity and the privilege to preach the truth to you. You maybe didn't understand it always, maybe you didn't always heed it, but in your life there's always been a presence of a preacher. To tell you the truth. And I'm not even talking about just me. I'm talking about every preacher in your life. God has been gracious to send to you. And what he says to them by way of encouragement. You may feel alone. You may feel left out. You may feel abandoned. But has God ever left you without somebody to tell you the truth? If they were going to answer, they would have to say, no. God sent prophets. God sent preachers, the voice of the prophets, the voice of the preachers, and then there's a third voice, the voice of the angels. How important is this gospel, this salvation into which you are called? How much can this salvation take you through whatever you are asked to endure on earth? Let me tell you how special it is. End of verse number 12, after he says that you have been blessed with those who ministered and preach to you uh, by the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. Which things the angels desire to look into? Wow. To preach a whole sermon on that one little phrase. I think his final point here is born out of an obsession. Complete obsession with how much God loves his church. I don't know if you get it or not. <laughs> but the people that comprise the church of Jesus Christ are the most important people in the world to God. Which is why, as the New Testament boldly and emphatically says, you better be careful how you treat them. Which includes ignoring them. Right? My class this morning, somebody brought up, we were talking about authority in church and, and, and how things ought to happen in church. Let me tell you something. The worst thing you can have on your record when you stand before Christ is that you never came. <laughs> because you're saying to them, you're not important. Why would anybody look at the most important group of people in the universe of all time and say, you're not important enough to me to even come and be with? You try that with your mama on Thursday morning. Text her and say, mama, I know you're important, but I just don't want to come. And you try to explain that to her. Why you don't want to come? The COVID thing, ain't none of that going to work then. Why? Because the expectation is if you love them, you will be there. Amen? The same thing is true of God's house. One of the things that Paul wrote that adds to this in, in, um, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, Paul makes this very strange statement. He, he's talking about the authority of, of the husband over the wife. He's talking about the authority structures in the church. And Paul was not a misogynist. He did not hate women. And the feminist crowd that likes to say that absolutely just don't know what they're talking about. But what he's saying is, look, in the house of God, in, in your families, there's got to be this order, this, this dynamic of authority that's got to be in place. And if it's not, everything blows up. And ladies and gentlemen, have we not seen that's what happens? It blows up when we don't follow God's plans. But then he says this. He says, ladies, and he's, he's speaking to you, and at that time there was a culture, the, the lady was supposed to keep her head covered as a sign of submission. 
We have not carried that forward in our society. I do not preach that as a literal requirement. I don't say that any of you have to wear a hat, although if you want to, you certainly can. Uh, you ladies can do all of that stuff. We men, it's wrong to wear a hat inside, or so we're told. You ladies can wear whatever you want. You've got the liberty. But in Paul's day, it was a sign of submission. Now, you can wrestle with that. You can disagree with it all you want to. But you take that up with Paul, and God saw fit to put it in there. Don't argue with me about it, okay? But then he says this. Here's why you do it. Because of the angel. Are we Catholic? I mean, what, what are we talking about here? I can really find only one valid explanation. The angels of heaven, a, a third, if you will, created life form, not human, a, angelic. They're different than we are. The only reason they appear human is so they won't scare us to death when we see them. <laughs> That's the only reason. That angelic being marveled at God's people. Why? They know how holy he is. They see it. They stand in his presence, ladies and gentlemen. And then they see us respond to him the way we do. One of the things, one of the last things I learned in texting, 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 listen to me, I'm a redneck. You know, texting. Somebody writes SMH at the end of their text. What does that mean? Come on. I know you teenage girls can tell me, right? All you older women know too. Don't sit there and act like you don't know. You'd absolutely know it means shake my head, I think. <laughs> what are they saying? I can't believe it. I think that when the angel looked into some congregation, shake their head if they only knew what God is like they wouldn't act the way they do if they knew who God really is they'd be here you see I think every church probably and I, this is not a Catholic tradition thing I don't know how else to take Paul's words I think angels are watching I believe that. I believe they're hearing what I'm saying right now. And I believe that they hear us, as we will tonight, testify of God's grace and mercy and salvation. And I think they'll shake their head all over again. Because they don't understand what it means to be undeserving of grace and mercy. To be such a rebel and such a sinner as to defy God with every act and attitude and word. And still, God reaches down to save them. They don't understand that. They don't know what it means to be redeemed. They don't understand. And Simon Peter says they earnestly desire to look into that. Just like the prophets. They want to know what that means because they don't. There was a segment of them that rebelled. Satan led them out of heaven. They followed him. Those are the demons. And they are forever, eternally damned to judgment in hell one day. There is no redemption for a fallen angel. None. They're a class not like us. They don't have, they don't have the same redeemable uh, uh, Spirit that we do it, and for whatever reason, they cannot repent. But humans can. And I wonder what angels think when we gather together. When they hear our messages, and they hear our preaching. And I'll tell you this. Angels don't desire to look into politics. They already understand all of that. They know what goes on behind closed doors. And what people do and deals that are made. And how people enrich themselves and how people empower themselves. They don't want to look into politics. They understand that. 
Angels don't gaze and listen to our sermons and, and want to look into the prosperity of Christians because, number one, they can't find that in the Bible God saw fit to write. And they've seen too many Christians suffer and pay the price for following Jesus. They don't want to look into that. They, they, don't want to, they don't want to look into acceptance of deviant lifestyles. Angels were the ones who led Lot and his family out of Sodom. They understand that. They don't want to look into these fabricated ideas of social justice and, and pitting race against uh, each other. They don't want to look into that because they see the darkness and sinfulness of every race and of every human heart. They don't want to look into that. But they want to look into this great salvation that you and I have. And I have to wonder what they think when we don't preach it. When we don't talk about it. When we're not enthralled by that. They understand injustice. They were straining at the battlements of glory when the one who was perfect on this earth was nailed to a cross. You don't think every one of them would have descended and delivered him in one moment? Yes, they would. That was the greatest injustice ever inflicted on anybody. They get it. But they don't get salvation. And when we preach all these other things, what must they be thinking. <laughs> I think they're shaking their head. When we both live it, give our life to it, obsessed with it. Ladies and gentlemen, hear Simon Peter's words. If you have not centered your life around the great salvation and all that that means that God has brought to you, if you don't draw your strength in troubling times from the great salvation that God has gone to the lengths of the universe to deliver to you. If you don't find your strength for daily living in the basis of the lengths to which God has gone to save you. You can't find it anywhere else. There's no motiv motivational speaker. There's no self-help book that's going to help you. If God has saved you, he will keep you. If God has saved you, he has loved you more than life itself. If God has saved you, he has put people, he has put things, he has put his Holy Spirit in your life in a way that a lost person does not have. Is there anything that would overcome us if God has saved? Let's stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed. Kelly, if you could just come and play for just a moment. Again, an opportunity. I don't know what any of us are going through today. And, but God knows every detail. As you play for just a moment, I give you an opportunity to come and pray. Maybe you just need to be reminded how much God does love you. What he has done to guarantee your redemption, your salvation, your your future glory with him if God has done what he has done there is no reason for any of us to lose heart
again, thank you for being here. It's good to be back with you folks. I'm Pastor James. Let me reintroduce myself to you. I appreciate Brother Kilby. What a fine man he is. I, I told someone uh, this week, someone in our state convention, that I respect Jim Kilby as much as I have ever respected any association with the EOM. He's a, he's a kind and gracious man. And I know he served you well in my absence. He, he loved being here, by the way. And I know that you sensed his spirit, and I appreciate him being here. Uh, tonight, remember to come back. What a grand service this always is. We get to enjoy a time of fellowship after. But now, as we leave today, I want us to pray for the Coble family, the Denny family, uh, the Good family. They will be beginning, I think, at 1 o'clock, the, um, the Comfort of Life procedure with uh, Dina's mom. And so let's, let's pray for them, what a, what a tough day this will be for them. So let's pray for God's grace uh, to undertake for them and to keep them. And I will see you back tonight. Let's bow together now. And um, is, I think that's all I need to say. Is anybody, am I forgetting anything, Rita? I'm, I'm good, right? I guess I am. No, no service Wednesday night. Sandy, if you would dismiss us, brother. Thank God for the salvation we have, man. I mean, that's why we get through, right? That's, that's why this family can face this afternoon. That's why we keep going is because of this great salvation.